Hi guys, we are from seminar group 7. Our topic is spread of oral infections. Firstly, I want to introduce my uh, fellow teammates, me, Jingwen, Jonathan, Wenxiong, and Lim Yen Sing. So let me briefly talk about our learning objective. First, explain concept of focal infection and focus infection. Secondly, differentiate various space infection and their causes. So what is a focal infection? Focal infection is a localized or general infection caused by dissemination of microorganism or toxic product from a focus infection. Focus of infection, which is a circumscribed area of tissue which is infected with exogenous pathogenic microorganism and is usually located near a mucus or cutaneous surface. So focal infection have two mechanisms. The first mechanism is metastasis of microorganism from an infected focus by either hematogenous and lymphogenous spread. The second mechanism is toxins may be carried through the bloodstream or lymphatic channels from a focus to a distant site where they may incite a hypersensitive reaction. So in oral foci of infection, there are a variety of situations in the oral view which can set up distant metastasis. First is infected periopical lesions such as the periopical granuloma, periopical cyst, or periopical abscess. The second is the teeth with infected root canals. The last is the periodontal disease which special reference to tooth extraction or manipulation. So uh, this is the picture of the cyst formation in the radicular part of the tooth which is the radicular cyst and radi radicular granuloma. Then this is the dental abscess and gran uh, radicular granuloma. So uh, usually in oral focal infection, bacteremia is found closely related to severity of periodontal disease present after manipulation of gingiva or more commonly in the tooth extraction. The microorganism usually been found was Streptococcus viridens. The rocking of teeth in their sockets by forceps before extraction has been proved to favor bacteremia in patients with periodontal disease. This action will allow the bacteria can invade to our systemic circulation through the hematogenous spread. So this is the picture of the periodontitis related to the systemic disease. And what is the significance of oral focal infection? Some diseases had been proved that they were closely related to oral focal infection based chiefly on the clinical evidence. These are arthritis and usually rheumatoid and rheumatic fever type. Second is valvular heart disease which is the subacute type bacterial endocarditis. Thirdly is gastrointestinal diseases. Ocular disease may also be related to oral focal infection. The fifth is skin disease. And the last is uh, renal disease. So this is the clinical feature of arthritis. And this is infective endocarditis which showing the clinical features of it. Hello, my name is Lim Yen Sing, O number 26, and I'll be talking about the infections of specific tissue spaces. Tissue spaces or facial spaces are potential spaces situated between planes of fascia that form natural pathways which infection may spread, causing cellulitis, or the infection may become localized, causing abscesses. Why are they called potential spaces? It is because they are not actually spaces until pus has been formed within it. These spaces are compartments that contain structures such as salivary glands, fats, or lymph nodes. It is hypothesized that infections may spread by hydrostatic pressure. The flow of infected fluids guided by resistance such as fascia, muscles, and bones. Drainage by perforation of a thin cortex occurs before that of a thick cortex. Muscle attachments may also determine the route of these infections. 
Spaces can be classified briefly into primary spaces, which are directly related to the teeth, and secondary spaces, which are indirectly related to the teeth. The important spaces in the maxillofacial region are the, in relation to the upper jaw, within the lip, within the canine, palatal subperiostal interval, the buccal space, maxillary antrum, infratemporal space, and the subtemporalis muscle interval. <coughs> and in relation to the lower jaw, it would be the submental space, submandibular space fossa, sublingual space, buccal space, submesoteric interval, parotid space, pterygomandibular space, pharyngeal space, and the peritonsillar space. Now we'll be talking about the spread of infection from maxillary teeth. Okay. Uh, the teeth of the central and lateral incisors, they uh, spread and form the labial, palatal, and vestibular abscesses. These abscesses are sometimes limited to within the lip, depending on the muscle attachment. And the can maxillary canines form the labial or the vestibular abscess. Okay. Canine space abscesses happens if it is above the levator muscle of the upper lip. In premolar maxillary teeth, it will form the buccal or the palatal abscesses, and long rooted premolars form the canine space abscess. Maxillary molars form the buccal and palatal abscesses. Buccal or palatal abscesses are formed if the site is below proximal. However, only buccal space abscesses are formed if it is above the muscle attachment. In the mandibular central and lateral incisors, it will form the labial abscess or the submental abscess. The labial abscess is formed if the pus penetrates above the muscle attachment, and the submental space will form abscess will form if it is below the muscle attachment. For the can mandibular canine, okay, it will form the labial or the vestibular abscess. Since all muscle attachments are below the canine root apex, pus only penetrates above the muscle attachment, forming abscess. In the mandibular premolar, it will form the vestibular abscess, sublingual abscess, and the lingual perforation abscess. And for mandibular first molars, it will either form the vestibular abscess, buccal space abscess, or the sublingual abscess. The vestibular abscess will form on the buccal side if the pus penetrates above the vaccinated attachment. Buccal space abscess is formed if it is below the muscle attachment, and sublingual abscess is formed if it is the pus penetrating from the lingual side. In uh, secondary second molars, uh, the, it will either cause the vestibular abscess, buccal space abscess, sublingual abscess, or the submandibular abscess. The vestibular or buccal space abscess is formed if the pus penetrates on the buccal side. Sublingual or submandibular abscess is formed if it penetrates from the lingual side. And in the third molars, it will either form the submandibular, pterygomandibular, or the submandibular abscesses. These are the buccal and palatal spaces. Okay, here is the molars. Okay, this is the palate, and this is the uh, buccal mucosa. Okay. So you can see the uh, this is the areas of the palatal space and the buccal space, okay. Okay, this is a, a better picture. From here, you can see the uh, vestibular abscess number one over here. Okay, it is be 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 before the uh, between the teeth and the uh, buccinator muscle, and number two, you can see the buccal space. This is the buccal space, okay, be before the buccinator muscle and between the buccinator muscle and between the vestibular space. And uh, number three is the palatal abscess, which forms on the palate. Number four is the sublingual space, which forms uh, between the molar and the tongue. And this is number five is the uh, submandibular space, which forms at the mandible. And number six is the uh, maxillary sinus, where the, the maxillary sinus space, the, the abscess form in the maxillary sinus, which is in the maxillary sinus. And there are also these, these are the secondary sets of spread, which are the parotid spaces, the temporal space, Infra temporal space and the pharyngeal spaces. Hi, I'm Wen Xiong, and I'm going to talk about a few of the space infections today. These are the list of space infections that I and Jonathan will be talking about. First up is canine space. It is located between the anterior surface of maxilla and the overlying levator muscle of the upper lip. Whenever there's an infection in this space, it will lead to the swelling with the obligation of the nasolabial fold, which is located at here, which is also known as the smile line. Pass may drain through the inner canthus of the eye. Here. Next is buccal space. It is surrounded by many landmarks. It is bounded medially by the buccinator muscle and buccopharyngeal fascia. Laterally, which is, a which is technically upwards, is the skin and subcutaneous tissue. 
Anteriorly, it is the posterior border of the zygomaticus major muscle, depressor angular oris muscle. Superiorly, there is a zygomatic arch, and inferiorly, it is the lower border of the mandible. Clinical features seen during a buccal space infection are very orbital edema and doom shaped swelling, which the swelling starts from the lower border of the mandible and access upward up to the level of the zygomatic arch. Next is infratemporal space. It is bounded by the maxillary tuberosity anteriorly, lateral pterygoid muscle condyle, and temporal muscle posteriorly. Laterally, it is bounded by the tendon of the temporal muscle and coronoid process. Lateral pterygoid plate and the inferior belly of the lateral pterygoid muscle is what bounds the infratemporal space medially. When there's an infection over the infratemporal space, there will be swelling over the sigmoid notch extraorally and the tuberosity intraorally. If the buccal space is infected as well, then the entire cheek will be involved. Christmas will also be seen and if there is an involvement of the pharynx, the patient will experience dysphagia and also severe pain. Infection of the infratemporal space is a rare clinical condition which occurs mostly due to dental infection, tooth extraction, fracture involving the maxillary sinus, and infection of the maxillary sinus itself. Now, I'm going to talk about the terrigo mandibular space. It is located at the inferior portion of the infratemporal space, which I have mentioned just now. It lies between the internal terrigoid muscle and the ramus of the mandible. Most zygomatic space extending anterior medially from the infratemporal space is considered a part of the pterygo mandibular space. Infection in the pterygo mandibular space can arise from the pericoronitis of the mandibular third molar and has occurred in cases of injection of the, of the local anesthesia into the space. In short, it means that by the extraction of either 3-8 or 4-8, there may be chances of pterygo mandibular space infection to occur. If an infection were to occur at this space, there will be trismus and severe radiating pain. However, there will be no evidence of clinical facial swelling. The swelling will only be at the lateral posterior portion of the soft palate and the uvula. Injection using an infected needle or solution at the maxillary tuberosity will cause this infection. Pterygo mandibular space abscess must be distinguished from the peritonsillar abscess as pterygo mandibular abscess has no dental involvement and clinically it will have less trismus. Lateral pharyngeal space is bounded anteriorly by the buccopharyngeal aponeurosis, parotid gland, and also the pterygoid muscle. Posteriorly, it is the prevertebral fascia, laterally, it is the carotid sheath, and familiarly, it will be the lateral wall of the pharynx. The source of infection is normally due to the infection of the third molar, sometimes also possible by the second molar. There will be trismus if the space is infected. The lateral pharyngeal wall may be swollen, dysphagia, and also difficulty in breathing may occur. This is due to the impingement of the pharynx as aforementioned that the space is bounded medially by the wall of the pharynx. Lateral pharyngeal space infection have the potential to spread upwards through the various foramina at the base of the skull and cause cavernous sinus thrombosis, meningitis, and also brain abscess. They can also spread posteriorly into the retropharyngeal space or invade the carotid sheath. Retropharyngeal space is bounded anteriorly by the wall of pharynx, posteriorly it is by the prevertebral fascia, and as for laterally, it is the retropharyngeal space and carotid sheath. Pain, dysphagia, nuclear rigidity, and also the bulging of the posterior pharyngeal wall is observed, and one side of it is normally more prominent because of the adherence of the median raphae of the prevertebral fascia. 
Infection may arise from the lateral pharyngeal space and an abscess may form, which will displace the buccal pharyngeal fascia forward and eventually impinges the pharynx. The last space for my part will be the parotid space. It is bounded superiorly by the zygomatic arch and inferiorly by the lower border of the mandible. It is bounded anteriorly by the posterior border of the mandible and posteriorly by the retromandibular region. Primary infection of the parotid space can break into the lateral pharyngeal space readily as the fascia is thin over the deep portion of the parotid space. Spreading of the infection superiorly to the temporal fossa may also occur. Clinical features seen during a parotid space infection are the elevation of the lobule of the ear and there is also a possible escape of the pus from the parotid duct when the duct is milked. These features are to distinguish from the subvestering space infection, which will be presented by Jonathan later on. It is important as these two spaces are very near each other. Thank you, Wenxiong, and hi everyone. Now we'll continue the presentation with the space of the body of mandible. The space of the body of the mandible is enclosed by a layer of fascia derived from the outer layer of deep cervical fascia, which attached to the inferior border of mandible and is split and it enclosed the body of mandible. It superiorly continues with the area mucor periosteum and the muscle of facial expression. It contains mandible, covering of periosteum, fascia, muscle attachment, blood vessel, nerve, teeth, and periodontal structure. The infections originating from incisor, cuspid, or bicuspid teeth can involve the space of the body of the mandible. Coming to submasseteric space, which is situated between the masseter muscle and the lateral surface of mandible ramus. Masseter muscle attached to mandible ramus has three sides, which is the deep part, superficial part, and also the middle part. The deep part is on the lateral surface of coronal process. The middle part is in a linear pattern on the lateral surface of ramus extending upward and backward, where the superficial part is close to the angle of the mandible. It anteriorly bounded by the adjoining of the retromolar fossa, and posteriorly by the parotid gland. So as we can see the figure here, the submasseteric space is between the masseter muscle and also the ramus of mandible. Coming to the clinical feature, the infection usually comes from mandibular third molar to the retromolar fossa. And through this fossa, the infection will spread to submasseteric space. So as uh, Wen Xiong just mentioned just now, there's, there are features that we can dis Distinguish the difference between the parotid space infection and submasseteric space infection. So in the parotid space infection, patient usually lack of trismus. There's the elevation of lobule of the ear, and there's a possibility of escape of the pus from the parotid gland in the parotid space infection. Well, in a submasseteric space infection, patient will experience severe trismus and pain facial swelling, and also seriously ill. Coming to submandibular space, it is located medial to the mandible and below the posterior portion of the mylohyoid muscle. It is medially bounded by the hyoglossus and digastric muscle, and laterally by the superficial fascia and the skin. So as we can see, this is the picture show here, is a frontal section through head in the molar region. So the pointer here is, is the mandible, and the darker line here is the mylohyoid muscle, and the submandibular space is located medial to the mandible and is a posterior portion of the mylohyoid muscle. As we can see, the submandibular gland is very near, is in this submandibular space. So the clinical features. Usually, patient, the infection will originate from the mandibular molar and it causes swelling near the angle of jaw. So the space abscess is triangular, usually from the lower border of mandible to the level of hyoid bone. It's due to the anatomic proximity, which is the sub-mandibular uh, gland and the lymph node is very close in the space. So cell and also lymphadenitis can be occurred. 
coming to Louis Angina, which is an acute, potentially life-threatening toxic cellulitis begin in the submandibular space. It's secondary from healing sublingual and also submental space. The disease is not considered as a true Louis Angina unless all submandibular space are involved. The main source of the infection usually is involvement of the mandibular molar, especially the second mandibular molar and third mandibular molar. So the other sources are submandibular gland saladenitis, oral soft tissue laceration, intraoral and perioral piercing, and penetrating injury of floor of the mouth like a stabbing wound, gunshot, or from the osteomyelitis due to the compound jaw fracture. So patients with the angina will rapidly develop and a broad-like swelling at the floor of the mouth and the swelling is firm, tender and diffuse. Patients will experience high fever, rapid pulse and fast respiration. Difficulty in eating, swallowing and breathing can, be, can occur. So the infection may spread to parapharyngeal space to carry or to the pterygoal palatine fossa. Coming to sublingual space, which is superior bounded by the mucosa or floor of the mouth, inferiorly by the mylohyoid muscle, posteriorly by body of the hyoid bone, anteriorly and laterally by the inner aspect of the mandibular body, medially by genohyoid, thyroglossus, and also genoglossus muscle. So as we can see the figure here, this is the sublingual space. And we can see this sublingual abscess is arised directly by perforating the lingual cortical plate above the mylohyoid attachment. So this abscess sometimes will infect the tongue since it's very, very close to the tongue. And sometimes the infection will come from other space like a submandibular space located here. Coming to clinical feature, there's, there will be obvious swelling of the mouth, dyspnea and dysphagia also occur. Coming to submental space, submental space is extend from anterior border of the submandibular space to the midline. It is limited in the depth by the mylohyoid muscle. It is laterally bounded by the anterior belly of the left, the right and the left digastric muscle. So anti is anteriorly bounded by internal border of corpus of mandible and posteriorly by the hyoid bone and the roof is mylohyoid muscle. Coming to the clinical feature, patient will, exp um, will occur with the anterior swelling at the submentus area, which is here, it's very obvious, and patient will experience dyspnea and dysphagia also. Coming to the last one, which is the maxillary sinusitis. It, in simple term, it's inflammation of maxillary sinus. So in the picture here, this is the maxillary sinus. It's usually due to the extent, distal extension of dental infection. It can be acute or chronic. It's, it's originates from bacteria, fungus, infectious disease, or local spread of the infection in adjoining frontal and paranasal sinuses, or traumatic injury of sinuses with the superimposed infection. So here is a table that shows the characteristic of the acute maxillary sinusitis and also chronic maxillary sinusitis. So in acute maxillary sinusitis, the duration usually is less than two weeks, and it's predisposing factors from acute periapical abscess or acute exacerbation of the chronic inflammation periapical lesion. Tryptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, Morosella catahalis usually is an ideological factor. So it, clinical features shows moderate to severe pain, swelling overlying the sinus, discharge of pus, facial experience fever and malice also. So the histological features show inflammatory infiltrations with edema of connective tissue and hemorrhage at the mucosa lining of the maxillary sinus. So coming to the chronic maxillary sinusitis, usually it's more than three months and is affected due to the upper respiratory viral infections or allergic sinusitis. 
anaerobes and streptococcus, bacteria, veronella is the main etiology. Patient will experience headache, fever, vegetable pain, upper toothache, stuffy sensation on the affected side of the face. So histological picture is show remarkable thickening and development of numerous sinus polyps. So polyps is simply have plastic granulation tissue with lymphocytic or sometimes plasma cell infiltration. There's mild lymphocytic infiltration of lining mucosa with squamous metaplasia of epithelium also. So this is the code for our Socrative quiz. And this is our reference. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.